In this video, I'm going to talk about how Christians read biblical violence with confirmation bias. In other words, how they engage with the biblical text and the passages that talk about biblical violence, but they do so by exercising their confirmation bias, and that as a result, they often don't really grapple with the full depth of the problem that is presented by biblical violence. Let's begin with a definition of confirmation bias, a very familiar concept I suspect to all of us. It is simply the tendency to selectively uh, engage with evidence. So evidence that supports our preconceptions, our prior beliefs, we tend to pay attention to that evidence. We give it a heightened importance in our assessment of uh, the truth of our beliefs. And evidence that goes against what our presuppositions are or what our background beliefs or prior beliefs are, we tend to be more skeptical of that evidence or we downplay it or we overlook it or we dismiss it. And that's confirmation bias. So it's a unjustified selective engagement with evidence to support our beliefs rather than to just uh, consider all the evidence such as it comes to us. Here's a cartoon that illustrates confirmation bias in somewhat of a humorous way. Uh, so this fellow says, I've heard the rhetoric from both sides. Time to do my own research on the real truth. So he does a search engine a search on the internet. And then we read literally the first link that agrees with what you already believe. That's the one that he clicks and he says jackpot. I actually had an experience that was literally this. I had a disagreement some years ago with somebody else and I went to Google to settle the disagreement and I ignored the first three pages of results that affirmed the position that was endorsed by the other individual. And like on the fourth search page, I finally found a link that supported me and I was like, yeah, jackpot, I got it. I was right after all. Now, the fact that I'm talking about this now, at least as I have the degree of self-awareness to recognize that I was exercising confirmation bias. But the challenge is that we're often not aware of how we do it. And one place where I find that that is the case is when it comes to the Bible. Now, when Christians read the Bible, obviously, they read the Bible against the backdrop of the theological assumption that God is perfectly good and merciful and loving. Uh, and so when Christians encounter biblical texts that appear to be inconsistent with God as being perfectly good, merciful, and loving, we tend to read those texts in accord with our confirmation bias so as to come out in a way that simply confirms what we already believe about God rather than challenging what we believe. Now, my point here is not that we should challenge what we believe about God by thinking, okay, maybe God isn't perfectly loving, good, or merciful after all. But rather, we need to consider how these texts are challenging that. And so how do we need to consider rereading these texts uh, if we want to continue to affirm that God is indeed perfectly good, loving, and merciful? As an example, let's turn to De Deuteronomy 20. Now, Deuteronomy 20, beginning in verse 10, is where God, Yahweh, outlines for the Israelites his plan as they enter the promised land, as it were, the land flowing with milk and honey and soon to be flowing with blood the land of Canaan. God begins by giving directions for how the people, the faraway tribes, should be treated as the Israelites invade the land. When you march up to attack a city, make its people an offer of peace. If they accept and open their gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labor and shall work for you. If they refuse to make peace and they engage you in a battle, lay siege to that city. When the Lord your God delivers it into your hand, put to the sword all the men in it. As for the women, the children, the livestock, and everything else in the city, you may take these as plunder for yourselves. Now, uh, I grew up reading the Bible. I think the first time I read it through was when I was about 12 or 13 years old. By the time I was in my mid to late teens, I was wrestling with these texts. And my standard Bible at the time was my NIV student study Bible, which was edited by Philip Yancey and Tim Stafford. And I would write a lot of notes in the sides of the Bible, in the margins, what we call marginalia, little margin notes, trying to wrestle with difficult passages such as this one. And this is a difficult passage by any measure. Imagine, for example, that the United States tomorrow decides that they're going to invade Canada, and they give Canada two options. Option one, uh, you all surrender immediately and become our slaves, and we take as plunder all of your material possessions and goods within the country. Option two, you try to fight back and resist our invasion, 
And if you do that, then we will kill every man in Canada, whatever 17, 18 million men there are in Canada. And then all the survivors, the women and the children will become our slaves. And we will still claim the rest of your country as our plunder. That would not be a very good option, right? Those would be a, a terrible options. Um, well, here's the incredible thing is when you look at my NIV study Bible when I was a teenager 30 some years ago, and I was writing in the margin notes, commenting on this passage, here's the actual page of that Bible. And you can see a note written on the side, which is talking about these very, adverse, these very verses from verses 10 to 14. Rather than say, this is shocking, this is a terrifying, uh, how do I reconcile a God of perfect love, good, uh, goodness, love, and mercy with the fact that God is giving you this option of enslavement or mass slaughter and enslavement? But this is what I said, mercy to surrounding cities, even after judgment. So I read the passage because I assumed God is always merciful. I was going to find mercy in this passage. And here the idea is that because God doesn't command that the women and children be butchered and that the men be butchered at the outset, uh, that he was willing to give them the option of being slaves. What I read from that was mercy. But of course, you wouldn't read mercy from that if the United States today was about to invade Canada. You'd think that was a terrible option. And so this is an example of confirmation bias. Uh, well, it becomes even starker as you move on in the passage, because then starting at verse 16, Yahweh shifts to giving directions for how to engage with the nearby seven tribes that are living within the land. Uh, and so from verse 16 to 18, this is what Yahweh says. In the cities of the nations, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Do not leave alive anything that breathes. Completely destroy them. The Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hevites, and Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshiping their gods. And you will sin against the Lord your God. So here the command is unequivocal. Do not leave alive anything that breathes, completely destroy. What do you do with that? Because uh, that is killing, slaughtering, butchering, not just men. Uh, first of all, they're not even given the option of enslavement. No, we are going to kill you. And we are not just going to kill the adult males. We're going to kill the elderly people, uh, the women, the, the mothers, the grandmothers, the handicapped people, the, the widows, the very poor people living on the margins of society, the teenagers, the small children, the infants. We're going to slaughter all of you until there is no, no, not one of you alive. What do you do with that passage? Because that would certainly meet the definition of what we today call genocide. Genocide is the targeted destruction of particular groups. So um, ethnic or religious or cultural groups. It, it actually need not include slaughtering or killing them, but it is the attempt to eradicate identity as such. And this is clearly, among other things, genocide. It's the attempt to destroy these identities as such. Well, we to return to my study Bible from high school, and you see I have a note written across the top of the page for exactly these verses, verse 16 to uh, 17 and 18. And here's what I say. Although seemingly bloodthirsty, besieged lands were given a chance at redemption. Also, idea of corporate sin. So here's my, my uh, engagement with the text. I'm, I'm saying at least by verse 16, yeah, this certainly looks bloodthirsty. Kill every living thing. Kill all the infants, right? Kill all the small children, all the women. That, that looks bloodthirsty. I agree. However, did you not read in verses 10 to 14, where at least in the faraway tribes, that people were given a chance to repent and become slaves? So even if in these near tribes, the only option is they must be slaughtered, there was still an option for the faraway tribes. So that's what I'm, I'm saying there, which, of course, I don't think is a very satisfactory response for, for the horrific nature and scope of this command. And then I also add, well, look, also there's this idea of corporate sin. So the fact that the adults did certain things, maybe that justifies slaughtering the children and the infants. And of course, even beyond that, it's, it's even if adults in a particular society do some terrible thing, it's 
very unlikely the case that every single adult within that society is culpable uh, for actually having done that thing, such as child sacrifice or something. Not everybody does it. Uh, and yet the command is to kill every living human being within that society without discrimination. So that is, again, I think a clear example of confirmation bias. My assumptions that God is perfectly good, loving, merciful says, I've got to find that in this passage somehow. And so I'm grasping at straws by saying, well, in 10, verses 10 to 14, he gave the option to become slaves, even if he doesn't give that here. He gave it there. And plus, they must have been all corporately guilty in some respect. We return then uh, to one last look at Deuteronomy 20 before I conclude. Uh, the text then goes on and talks about trees. When you lay siege to a city for a long time, fighting against it to capture it, do not destroy its trees by putting an axe to them, because you can eat their fruit. Do not cut them down, are the trees people that you should besiege them. Uh, so the last statement then is, but leave the trees standing because they might have some fruit you can eat. And uh, returning to my Bible, I had a note on that as well. You can see it on the left side and it's starred uh, verses 19 and 20. I say this, verses 19 and 20 encapsulates the edict to subdue the earth. Leave trees to grow, but still use for fruit, remembering their place. So um, here I'm, I'm alluding back to uh, the creation mandate of Genesis 1:28, where God says, fill the earth and subdue it. And so I'm saying this is in keeping with the proper governance of creation, uh, allowing trees to exist for the purpose of giving fruit to genocidaires who are invading countries, I guess. Um, no, but seriously, it's leave the trees because they're giving fruit. And so that makes sense. And so that's something positive that I wanted to affirm in the text. And so that's how I engaged with Deuteronomy chapter 20, um, which as I said, is one of the starkest examples on its own terms of genocide. Now, I know that there are biblical scholars, um, and it, actually I should say particularly Christian apologists, who want to point out and emphasize that in Deuteronomy and Joshua, there is also language of driving them out of the land. That's another conversation. Um, and I certainly address that in Jesus Loves Canaanites, because they try to argue, well, it's really not genocide because they were also being driven out of the land. But the fact remains that in Deuteronomy 20, in this passage right here, the self-contained directive is to eradicate it, every living thing. Uh, and even again, if you want to say, well, every living thing, well, maybe that's hyperbolic formulaic language. Well, the, there's no hint that anybody who was left within the land and refused to leave would have had anything but the sword put to their neck. So, I mean, I think that's that's just not helpful. And so the reality is that any just reading engagement with this text on its own terms says what we have here is genocide. And genocide should go to the very heart of the claim that God is perfectly loving, good, and merciful. And so you really have to think about these confessions about God and the challenge that this text presents to them. But I didn't do that. Uh, instead, running it through my confirmation bias, what I was saying is, hey, God is merciful. Uh, and because he's giving at least the faraway tribes the options of becoming enslaved before all the men are slaughtered. And he's not slaughtering their women and children. And even with the near tribes, well, you know, they probably deserved it in toto, all of them, because of corporate sin. And, of course, there's this thing about the fruit trees, right? That God's sparing the fruit trees for the people, which is in accord with the creation mandate. And so in ways like this, Christians can go, frankly, for years by kind of screening out the most shocking and morally troubling aspects of biblical violence and never really confronting it. That is the confirmation bias governing your engagement with scripture. It may keep you in a safe space in terms of ferreting out or minimizing the cognitive dissonance that you should be experiencing. But rest assured, you should be experiencing cognitive dissonance. And I believe that that should challenge you to revisit how you read and engage the text, because ultimately you have to choose. Is God a God of genocide? Or is God a God that I would recognize in any other circumstance as loving, good, and merciful? Because in any other circumstance, you would not recognize a God who commanded the mass genocidal slaughter and enslavement of peoples as loving, just, and merciful.